so shall we all mute except uh, the person who's going to be talking the way to Okay. So Heba, we're two minutes past eight. I think we can start. Can we start? Yes, please. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the seventh uh, episode of the Cairo University uh, Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strobismus Unit. Uh, first of all, um, I'd like to send my greeting to uh, uh, our distinguished um, moderator for the past uh, six episodes, Dr. Rasha Zidane, wishing her a very speedy recovery. Uh, we will miss you today, Russia, and hope you will be with us uh, the next episode, inshallah. Uh, and I'm very happy to have my partner for today, uh, Dr. Dina Hossam. Hi, Dina. Hi, Dr. Heva. My pleasure. Uh, thank you, Dina. Uh, today, we are going to start with uh, one of our uh, dilemmas with the squint or with the strobismus with Dr. Ariham, Dr. Ahela. And uh, the second part of the episode would be with uh, the dilemma of the leukocoria and uh, the retinoplastoma and its differential diagnosis with our esteemed professor, Dr. Ihab Saad. So uh, we'd like to be with us and to um, have um, a good time. Uh, so we will start with uh, Dr. Ihab Qasim. She will tell us when the torsion will mislead us. Uh, so we'll start, uh, we are going to be with you, Dr. Rehab. You can share your screen. Did I share it well? Did I share it well? Not yet, Doctor. Have not yet. Did I share it? No. I said that I can't share it. Now I'm just going to read it. I'm not sure. Rehab, you see the green uh, share screen sign? And you're clicking it? You have the option to share your screen or not? Yes. yes. It's okay. Okay. Um, this title was actually suggested by our professor, Dr. Hele Hededi, uh, when torsion misleads you. Uh, first of all, what's torsion? Torsion or cycloduction is rotation of the globe around the y-axis, which traverses the globe from uh, front to back. Uh, rotation of the 12 o'clock meridian outwards or temporally is called extortion, and rotation of the 12 o'clock meridian nasally or inwards, it's called intortion. Uh, the phobia lies at the junction of the upper two thirds and the lower third of the disc 
or at, in, at level of the lower half of the optic disc. In, in X torsion, there is outwards rotation of the globe, so the fovea goes down. In in torsion, there is inwards uh, rotation of the globe, so the fovea uh, goes up. The intortors of the eye are the superiors, superior oblique, and superior rectus. The extortors are the inferiors, inferior oblique, and the inferior rectus. So causes of excitro torsion and incitro torsion are excitro torsion is produced by overaction of the inferiors, inferior oblique and inferior rectus, or underaction of the superiors, superior oblique and superior rectus. Incitro torsion is caused by overaction of the superiors, which cause intortion, the superior oblique and the superior rectus, or under action of the intortors, uh, sorry, under action of the uh, extortors, which are the inferior oblique and the inferior rectus. On fundus examination, normally, as I said before, the fovea lies at the uh, lower half of the optic disc. In extortion, uh, in direct view, the fovea lies below this, the lower half of the optic disc. And in intortion, uh, the fovea lies above the upper half of the optic disc. This is the direct view. Uh, in indirect ophthalmoscopy, it could be reversed. This is a direct ophthalmoscopic picture. Uh, the fovea lies at the junction of the upper two thirds and the lower third of the disc, which is normal. Uh, in macular extortion, the fovea lies below the disc. And in macular intortion, in this picture, the fovea lies above the middle of the optic disc. Uh, superior oblique palsy uh, causes extortion because the superior oblique is an intortor. And so we see macular extortion in superior oblique palsy. Uh, my case presentation here uh, is this child uh, presenting with right head tilt, right face turn, and chin depression. So I diagnosed her as left superior oblique palsy. And this is another picture of the same child when she grew bigger before any surgery was performed. Uh, on straightening the head, the left eye shows uh, hypertrophy. Uh, on Pilchowski head tilt test, uh, on left head tilting, uh, there is increased left hypertrophy. So the hypertrophy increases on tilting uh, the head to the same side of the superior oblique palsy. On tilting the head to the right, i.e. on the opposite side of the superior oblique palsy, there is no hypertrophy. And uh, on motility examination, uh, there is limited depression on adduction of the left eye, suggestive of weakness of the superior oblique muscle. And there is uh, over elevation on adduction of the left eye, suggestive of uh, secondary inferior oblique overaction. This is on right gaze. On left gaze, there's no superior oblique underaction and there's no if you're oblique overaction. In addition, she has left hypertropia and a V pattern. So all are suggestive of left superior oblique palsy. However, on fundus examination, I found bilateral uh, macular extortion and not just left macular extortion. So I was wondering, was it a left superior oblique palsy or was it bilateral masked or asymmetric superior oblique palsy? Uh, looking up uh, the, the literature, uh, I, I quoted this table from Kenneth Wright, uh, differentiating between unilateral and bilateral superior oblique palsy. Uh, in unilateral superior oblique palsy, there is superior oblique underaction and inferior oblique overaction in the same eye. In bilateral, it affects both eyes. The hypertrophy is more prominent in unilateral than bilateral superior oblique palsy. The V pattern is more prominent in bilateral cases. Uh, the head tilt test, there's increasing hypertrophy on ipsilateral tilt only. Uh, in bilateral superior oblique palsy, there is right hypertrophy on right tilt and left hypertrophy on left tilt. On the double matrix right test, uh, there is less than 10 degrees of extortion in unilateral cases, more than 10 degrees of extortion in bilateral cases. And on fundus examination, macular extortion is ipsilateral in unilateral cases and bilateral in bilateral cases. So the only finding I found here was bilateral macular extortion, or all other findings were suggestive of just left superior oblique palsy. So I asked myself, was it left or bilateral? Only bilateral macular extortion is present. Uh, 
I, I thought it was bilateral mass asymmetric sphere of big palsy based on the presence of bilateral macular extrusion. And I did bilateral surgery in the form of bilateral asymmetric graded imperial oblique recession, uh, where I uh, sutured the imperial oblique muscle two millimeter, the left one, uh, two millimeters behind the temporal pole of the imperial rectus muscle, and the right imperial oblique, uh, four millimeters behind the temporal pole of the imperial rectus muscle. So I did uh, more weakening of the imperial oblique on in the left eye, uh, where I was sure there was imperial oblique palsy, and I did less weakening of the imperial oblique in the other eye, where I thought there was less uh, degree of imperial oblique palsy. Uh, however, this was doing bilateral surgery was an inappropriate uh, surgical decision based on an inappropriate diagnosis of bilateral superior oblique palsy. Postoperatively, shortly postoperatively, uh, the girl uh, still had a right face turn. The imperial oblique overaction uh, almost disappeared. Uh, and the motility was uh, more or less good in all directions, except for uh, still um, left imperial oblique under action. One year later, she still had a right head tilt. And three years later, she still had a right head tilt, which was never uh, So it was actually a left superior oblique palsy and not a bilateral uh, masked uh, superior oblique palsy. So to conclude, uh, just finding only bilateral macular extrusion is not enough to diagnose bilateral spiro oblique palsy. In this case, it was left and not bilateral spiro oblique palsy, and bilateral inferior oblique, inferior oblique recession was inappropriate because the right head tilt still persisted. So only left inferior oblique recession was indicated in this case. Thank you, Dr. Arihab, for such, uh, uh, for presenting or for sharing this case with us. And um, I think um, uh, all of us would uh, do the same as you, or the majority of us will may uh, be tricked with this uh, uh, fund distortion, the bilateral fund distortion in this girl. And I think uh, the majority of us would do the same you did, and you, we may think about a masked uh, bilateral sphere oblique uh, palsy. Um, still, um, I think Dr. Hela Hilali may share her experience with us to tell us how is the fund distortion could be a misleading in such cases. Uh, so, would you please uh, share with us, Dr. Hela, your experience in such cases? Dr. Hela, you are muted. Dr. Hela, please Dr. Hela, uh, mute. Uh, I'm mute. It's just and then I'm trying to share my screen and I'm it not shared. It was shared, but you just it was. You, you shared I the didn't desktop. See it. Uh, you share the desktop. So if you open, if you just open up the presentation on the desktop, I think it will be okay. shared. It will be shared. Okay, yes. great. Thanks. Yes, exactly. Thank you. It's okay. Okay. Uh, so I want to thank Rehab for agreeing to uh, do this presentation with me and uh, humoring me on this. Um, so, uh, Diagnosing superior oblique palsy, it's important to distinguish between the presence of bilateral and unilateral superior oblique palsy in order to formulate the right surgical plan. And when we fail to identify the presence of bilateral superior oblique palsy and do surgery uh, unilateral on, a, on, on, a, on one of the eyes only, uh, we end up postoperatively with unmasking superior oblique palsy in the contralateral eye. Um, so the aim of my talk today is to answer two questions, uh, hopefully. One is how reliable is the presence of bilateral objective excitotorsion in diagnosing bilateral spherodic palsy? And if it isn't reliable, then what is? Uh, we have really pointed out to uh, uh, the features of bilateral superior oblique palsy, I'm sorry. 
um, which when present uh, make the diagnosis relatively easy. Um, if you find bilateral spherobate dysfunction, reversal of hypertropia on side gazes, presence of the V pattern, reversal of the Bilchowski head tilt test, and excyclotorsion more than 15 degrees, then you have all the features that suggest that this is bilateral spherobate palsy. And I'll show you a, a case, one of my cases here. This was a bilateral acquired sphere of the palsy. Uh, in primary position, the, the patient preferred to fix with the eye with the uh, more paretic uh, muscle and uh, the other eye was hypotropic. But you can see here that on left gaze, uh, on right gaze, there was a left hypertropia and that reversed to presence of a right hypertropia on left gaze and that there was a bilateral underaction of both superior oblique muscles with defective depression in adduction bilaterally. There was also uh, a large excyclotorsion on double Maddox rod testing, about 30 degrees of excyclotorsion. There was also bilateral fundus uh, excyclotorsion. And this, uh, this makes the diagnosis of bilateral superior oblique easy, uh, palsy easy. However, uh, in other cases, uh, especially when there is a, a, a large asymmetry between the sphere of the palsy in both eyes, the diagnosis becomes much more difficult. And Dr. Kushner published in 1988 a really nice article about uh, how to make uh, the, uh, that diagnosis possible. And he categorized patients into uh, two categories, those with almost masked sphere of the palsy and in these cases, there was no reversal of the, uh, uh, of the uh, hypertropia in side gazes. And there was no reversal of the hypertropia on the Bilchowski head tilt test, but there was only reversal when prism and cover test was performed in oblique directions of the gaze. Uh, these were cases that may, you, may, you may not be able to pick up with a three-step test because it doesn't. Uh, take into consideration the oblique directions of gaze. So if you look at case one, for example, from his series with the patient with right hypertropia in primary position, you will find that there is no reversal except when the patient uh, was looking uh, with the left eye in elevation and a deduction. And only in that position of gaze did the hypertropia reverse to the left eye. And in the second case, the same thing happened when the left eye was uh, depressed in a deduction in the field of action of the defective or paretic superior oblique. And in, only in that uh, condition did the uh, hypertropia reverse. And he called these the almost masked category when the uh, hypertropia um, reversed to the, left, to the less paretic eye in oblique side cases. And this emphasizes the importance of doing prism and cover test in all nine directions of cases to be able to catch that or pick up that. However, there are other cases where the hypertrophy in the lesser affected eye does not appear in any field of gaze. And he used or described other signs where, uh, bec which become important to uh, identify these completely masked bilateral sphere of the palsy cases. Subjective excyclotorsion, more than 10 degrees, a V-shift between up gaze and down gaze, and a very important tip, the small hypertropia in primary position, which becomes a large hypertropia when this eye is adducted, presence of a chin down position. And he stressed the importance of objective torsion present bilaterally in the diagnosis and actually relied heavily in his article on uh, presence of bilateral objective torsion, which is what they have used to make that diagnosis. And he stated in his article that uh, when he found the, uh, um, some of these signs or uh, especially the uh, bilateral uh, objective torsion, he performed bilateral asymmetric surgery and they all worked well. And this is an example of, of a masked case from his, uh, uh, masked bilateral sphere of the case from his series where you find in the primary position little or no hypertropia, but the hypertropia becomes apparent when that eye is adducted. No other signs of reversal of hypertropia, but the only other signs are the excyclotorsion, both the subjective and objective bilateral excyclotorsion. Later on in 2009, however, Krishna retracted the statement and stated 
uh, that bilateral fund distortion can be misleading. And if the, the patient alternated fixation between both eyes or fixed with the paretic eye, then the objective X cyclotorsion can shift to the non paretic eye. That was just a remark. There was no series of patients that he uh, was, was uh, publishing or anything. And then in, in 2020, Hong and his uh, co workers published an article um, about a study in which they um, uh, looked at the incidence and pattern of bilateral fundus excyclotorsion in cases with unilateral superior, superior oblique palsy that were confirmed by MRI imaging. Uh, they confirmed by MRI the presence of a unilateral hypoplastic superior oblique muscle. And in this series of unilateral superior oblique uh, palsy cases that were all congenital, 212 uh, patients, 8.5% showed bilateral excyclotorsion in absence of any other signs of bilateral superior oblique palsy. No signs described by, uh, none of the signs described by Dr. Kushner were present in any of these cases except the bilateral excyclotorsion. They found that the excyclotorsion was symmetric in both eyes in 66.7% of the patients, asymmetric in 33.3% of the cases. So 8.5% of cases with unilateral superior oblique palsy can show bilateral excyclotorsion, even when the superior oblique palsy was strictly unilateral. This is the MRI of, of one of the patients in their series. You can see the red arrow pointing to the hypoplastic superior oblique uh, muscle, and you can see the bilateral excyclotorsion in the same person, in the same patient. They also uh, looked at bilateral superior oblique palsy cases. They had seven, and bilateral excyclotorsion was present in 100% of these cases. Again, 71.5% uh, of these cases showed bilateral uh, symmetric excyclotorsion, and um, only 28 and 28.6% showed asymmetric excyclotorsion. So there was no difference really in the pattern between the unilateral sphere of the uh, palsy cases and bilateral sphere of the palsy cases in the symmetry or asymmetry of the excyclotorsion. Also looked at the, compared the angle of the excyclotorsion in unilateral and bilateral superior oblique palsy cases and found that there was a very little difference or an insignificant difference in the uh, fundus excyclotorsion angle, but a significant difference in the uh, subjective excyclotorsion angle. It was much larger in the bilateral superior oblique palsy cases than in the unilateral superior oblique palsy cases. They concluded that the presence and the pattern of bilateral excyclotorsion cannot distinguish presence of unilateral bilateral sphere of the uh, palsy. You cannot use them to identify uh, bilateral sphere of the palsy alone. And their patients underwent unilateral surgery without unmasking superior of the palsy in the contralateral eye. They also concluded that subjective excyclotorsion is greater in bilateral sphere of the palsy and can be a distinguishing factor in the diagnosis of bilateral superior oblique palsy. So why did that happen? Uh, Kim and his coworkers in 2019 attributed the appearance of excyclotorsion in an eye that has no palsy to ocular dominance. And they uh, stated that if the paretic eye is the dominant eye, then when, with prolonged fixation with that eye, the, there will be a decrease in the excyclotorsion in the paretic eye. And by conjugate cycloversion, the excyclotorsion can shift to the non paretic eye. According to Herring, Herring's law, that is true. There's also another theory that may also be caused, the, the excyclotorsion in the other eye can be caused by anatomic pathologies, like the presence of bilateral heterotopic rectus muscle pulleys, in addition to the superior of the hypoplasia. And Hong and his coworkers did identify three cases in their series where pulleys were displaced in cyclotorsional direction. So that again can be one of the reasons why. So in conclusion, we cannot use bilateral uh, excyclotorsion to make the diagnosis of bilateral superior oblique palsy alone. So what about other tests? How sensitive are they in diagnosing bilateral superior oblique palsy. 
And this was published in 2014 but by Dr. Guyton's group. Um, so they found that the Bilchowski head tilt test was only 40% sensitive in diagnosing bilateral sphere of big palsy. The Parks three-step test, 24% sensitive. Reversal of hypertrophia in oblique positions and lateral gaze, 60% sensitive. And the highest sensitivity came from the subjective bilateral excyclotorsion more than 10 degrees, uh, other, either by the double Maddox rod or the Lancaster red green test. Um, so I don't think that there is one uh, single thing that is uh, super sensitive, but a combination of signs and uh, several signs can together point you to the right direction. And I will uh, like finally leave you with a, uh, with a question. Is mask bilateral superior oblique palsy always what it seems? And I would uh, like to invite you to read that article about mask bilateral superior oblique palsy. Uh, is it a simple overcorrection phenomenon? It was um, one of Dr. Guyton's papers. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hela, uh, for this um, 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 explanation and this uh, overview of the literature. Actually, as you said, um, is the um, diagnosis of uh, a masked the bilateral spirogly course is a little bit uh, a dilemma. It is not uh, an easy um, task. And as you said, there is no a, a sensitive or there is no a, a well sensitive or a test that we can rely on. It is a combination of different uh, tests and different examinations. I think the, the, the one that, as you said, is the subjective or the high uh, subjective uh, torsion. This is the, the one that we can rely on um, for um, ensuring that it is a bilateral. Uh, True, but uh, for you to be able to do the subjective excyclotorsion, this must be an adult. Yeah. And in many cases, we are dealing with the congenital. Um, we uh, cannot. And we can do the uh, and and also the subjective excyclotorsion um, is much less in in congenital cases than in acquired cases. Yeah. So uh, it's this is really a test for more for the acquired than the congenital and yeah. for the adults more than the young people. We can hardly uh, sometimes even get measurements in the oblique directions of gaze. So it's yeah. just uh, enough to do uh, an examination in the oblique direction uh, directions of gaze and just do the cover test. And if you can see any reversal, yeah. that, that will be helpful. Okay, and, and if we can um, return back to the explanation for the bilateral torsion in cases of unilateral spiro peak, or see, we have got uh, two main theories. I think the um, neural adaptation theory and the eye dominant theory and yes. obeying the hearing rule. And the other one is the anatomical theory with the heterotropic um, uh, extraocular muscles. What is the one that you um, vote for? Is it the neural adaptation, adaptation or the anatomical theory? No, the, the, uh, the, the one actually, you, are, you are believing in. It's... No, uh, Rehab called me uh, after she did that case and uh, she said, do you have any explanation why uh, a case of bilateral uh, uh, excyclotorsion, there's bilateral excyclotorsion in unilateral sphere of the palsy? And I told her my explanation and uh, I think it is uh, about the ocular dominance and about which eye is the fixing eye. Uh, and But my observation, and I, I, I've seen that in other cases, is that when uh, that happens, I find that the excyclotorsion is, is more in, in the actually the normal eye, the angle of excyclotorsion becomes bigger and that follows Herring's law in, in my opinion. So yeah. uh, you, you will find uh, excyclotorsion in the paretic eye. And then when you are examining um, uh, the uh, the, when, when you're examining the sound eye and the paretic eye is the fixing eye and the patient will then uh, try to correct that, you will get much more excyclotorsion in the normal eye and that is what you will see. And I've seen that many times and I believe that this is the explanation. 
I, I, I think I, that's I, I haven't, we, we, we were not really good enough uh, with MRIs to be able to identify heterotopic pulleys. And so they may be present again, they may be present. Yeah. So what yeah. you were explaining is similar to a secondary angle of deviation in a. That's that. That was my theory, and that's what I explained to the head, and that's what I told her. I th I, I think uh, happens, and I've noticed that myself in, in in many patients. And then I found I found the theory about ocular dominance as well. Okay. May oh. I ask Dr. Hala a question and Dr. Rehab a question? So when you're in yeah, um, suspicious about a bilateral mass superior oblique palsy. What are you inclined more to do? Like operate on the eye where you're sure it has a palsy and warn the patient that a second surgery might be needed or rather uh, do a bilateral asymmetric surgery which might end up with such a case like Dr. Rahat's case. Rahat, go ahead first. After that case, I never did bilateral surgery. I never was <laughs> sure it was bilateral. Yeah. <laughs> Because, yeah, I was tricked by such a case before, but I think you're a bit lucky because the patient still uh, can fuse. Because in a case, it might induce a constant vertical deviation. And in such a case, the correction is mandatory. So my second question was, what would you do then if you have then a vertical deviation, not just the head tilt being able to fuse? How, how reversible is this surgery? advance the, the inferior oblique muscle. Yani if, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not easy. There are lots of adhesions. But yani I did once, it was very easy. Another time, there was lots of adhesions. But if you can do it, I think it's uh, correct. That's so easy. like to put it back in the correct position in the eye where, okay. Yani around, uh, eight millimeters behind the eye. So Dr. Hala, have you any experience regarding uh, this? So first of all, um, I would do everything in my power to uh, unmask a superior oblique palsy. But if I, and, and if there are no sure signs that, that this is bilateral, I would do it a unilateral case. And I would uh, warn the parents that there may be a, a, a reversal or a, a need for another surgery um, in, the, uh, uh, in the other eye. But again, the article I put at the end of, uh, of my presentation uh, also tells us that um, when we operate on uh, cases of unilateral superior oblique palsy and we get what appears to be a superior oblique palsy in the other eye, it doesn't mean that this was a mass superior oblique palsy and we missed it. Many times it's just an overcorrection of our first surgery. So uh, this is something to keep in mind. Um, but if, I'm, if I am sure, now if you operate bilaterally, you mean, and you end up with a vertical deviation? Yes. Um, I'm not sure I, that this surgery would be reversible. I would not be able to reverse what I did, but I would deal with that uh, vertical deviation in the best way I can. Um, uh, I may operate on an inferior rectus muscle uh, to correct the vertical deviation in the other eye. That's probably what I would do, but I, I would think it very hard to go back and, and reverse what I did on the inferior oblique. Can, can I ask a question here uh, about the, come on, fascinated by the presentation and uh, thank you all for the invitation. And uh, you know, the, the, as Dr. Hala mentioned, the big angle in extracular torsion means bilateral and i think it's very subjective when you examine a kid or a, a young a youngster and uh, even we we we're not sitting straight we sometimes moving around but it's a bit subjective to measure the angle the inconsistency of how we examine a child is there any objective way uh, thinking like a regular uh, fundus photo and also in the supine position i'm using the red cam as you know it, so the patient in the supine position, would the excited torsion be that much? And can a red cam image, you know, with all its wide angle viewing and we can kind of measuring the uh, excited torsion be an asset or an additional way of confirming our impression of the excited torsion? Okay, would you do that with the patient? Now, it would be very difficult to do that with the patient awake, right? You do that uh, with the well, patient under sedation? 
No, if the, if the child, I think, is more than three years verbal, we can yes. communicate, we can do this uh, while, while awake, you know, just, you know, try to explain. And there are kids that are obedient in this perspective, Jan. Just lie supine, we just put a, a topical anesthetic without putting a speculum, we can have a very nice image of the, like at one click of a button, yeah, if, uh, it, uh, with the patient lying supine. Okay, and you would ask the patient to fix, Yani, it's very difficult to get the patient to fix the light. What we usually do when we are unable to, uh, to examine the patient when he's awake is uh, dilate the patient and take a good look uh, at the beginning of the surgery. Yeah, yeah but, um, this is very subjective and controversial. And I'm just thinking, how could this be consistent and agreed upon? And I think, Dr. Ahela, if you examine a child and Dr. Dina will examine the same child and Dr. Rehab and Dr. Heba, everybody will have a kind of a different opinion, not a consistent opinion, you know? But this, if this comes as the only, you know, whenever the excitation is big, as the only sure sign, how can we be consistent in measuring this exact rotation? This was my question. By fundus photography, if you can, yes. We, okay. we do that for the adults, but I'm, again, I'm not sure how accurate that will be. Because as you said, you would have to get the patient to be looking straight ahead and... I think, yeah, we can with the other eye. You know, if you just have to fix something with the other eye, I think it's possible. And you might be looking into that as well, you know? So the... Yeah. You know, to be, I think it might be interesting for you guys along this way. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Ahab, for the ad. Thank you. Uh, so, um, to wrap up, uh, there is no a single test that you can relay on for the diagnosis of uh, masked bilateral spiropy palsy. It's a combination of uh, tests. There is, uh, you should be meticulous in your clinical examination. Uh, bilateral torsion could occur in cases of unilateral spiropic palsy. If you are not sure of a bilateral spiropic palsy, please operate on the eye you are sure of and uh, then uh, follow the patient and deal with uh, the consequences later on, right? Thanks, okay. Dr. Rahab, for this very rich discussion and okay. moving on the dilemma of torsion we'll move to another dilemma, which is the leukocoria in the child. And we're very honored to have Dr. Ihab uh, as the guest speaker in our meeting today. And uh, looking forward to a very informative presentation as we're always used to from Dr. Ihab. Yes, can you please? Thank you very much, Dr. Dina. I, I cannot express how glad I am to uh, be uh, joining you in uh, this yeah, long awaited uh, uh, seminars of yours uh, that would, uh, I think the, you know, the feedback is always tremendous and excellent uh, when we talk about uh, the impact of the pediatric department on, on all over Egypt and even the area. So, um, uh, I'd like to share with you in the next few minutes <coughs> my, uh, you know, the exp experience and perspective. We meet those cases amply in, uh, in, in Egypt. And it's really important to make the, distinguish, the, the, the distinction and to see the differences. Why so? Because it is important to identify the retinal detachment uh, in those pediatric age group, whether regmatogenous, exudative, or tractional, and the type of detachment, of course, um, to differentiate it from retinoblastoma. You know, retinoblastoma is a big issue. So these are, you know, two kids presenting about the same age, <clears throat> unilateral affection, isotropia, the ultrasound in this child will show a detachment, maybe will show a condensation somewhere, uh, dragging, and the CT is not conclusive as well due to the presence of a hyperdense opacity in the vitreous. And also the ultrasound here will show a detachment, maybe a mass, some calcification. The uh, uh, CT here uh, is uh, also showing some hyperdense opacity. The other eye has something here. And by doing a vitrectomy in eye, if we opt to do it, uh, we uh, might cure this eye. And if we do a vitrectomy in this child, we literally kill the chi this child in six months time by exteriorizing retinoblastoma. So the distinction and differential is extremely important because we are not anymore dealing with an eye that has an anomaly. We are dealing with an eye that can harbor a cancer and uh, by opening up this eye, 
uh, by whatever maneuver, we will end up by uh, uh, killing this child literally in six months time. And there's no way uh, to save because <clears throat> the immediate rebound will be, wow, we did a big mistake. And then we'll try to see what will happen and time will go by without proper intervention. Um, there is always the concept of shifting fluid, which I like to emphasize. This is a child with VKH, with Vokt Kainagi Harada. He was around six years old, and uh, this is the red cam image while in supine and then prone position. The, uh, you, know, the, you see the amazing shifting fluid, and you really have to encounter a case and do the, the, the test in the two position to see how the fluid shifts with the explanation of blurred vision in the, when he wakes up in the morning and then it gets better as the day goes by because of the flattening of the retina. Of course, the, um, you know, the other investigation uh, um, you know, did uh, uh, ensure the VKH and he was treated by periocular tramsinone and he did really well. <clears throat> Back in the early 2000s, there was a paper, paper by the Shields et al. Uh, saying that 58% uh, of the uh, uh, retinoblastoma, the leukocoria cases referred were uh, considered retinoblastoma, to be considered retinoblastoma are not really retinoblastoma. Uh, the, with the improvement in the awareness and the diagnostic uh, skills and uh, um, uh, the uh, awareness of the retinoblastoma and the method of, methods of the examination, the correct diagnosis rose up to 78%. So now we can identify surely and uh, uh, with more confidence, retinoblastoma, and the list of differential diagnosis of the whole list, the huge list you can see, has shrunken down to uh, only uh, 20, uh, um, so to be 22 percent, uh, 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 which makes us more um, more eminent and more uh, clinically oriented, thorough uh, uh, surgeons or clinicians. Coats disease comes on top of the list. And the, the telangiectasia means leaky vessel. And of note, uh, telangiectatic vessels dilates and shrinks and dilates and shrinks and dilates and shrinks. And whenever we do the red cam, the uh, fluorescein angiography, you will be amazed by how much uh, capillary non-perfusion is present in the periphery to the point that the extreme slow circulation has a marsh where you can actually see the RBCs flowing into the vessel uh, in a very slow and stagnant circulation. So it's, it's a, a rare congenital non-familiar idiopathic vascular developmental disease of the retina, characterized by three major criteria, telangiectasia, exudation and detachment, and capillary non-perfusion. Looking at tens of cases of, of Coates disease, I think capillary non-perfusion should be placed first, where the, the, I think the pathogenesis and the triggering is the non-perfusion. It's been described for a long time and the different nom nomenclature. In 2010, uh, uh, on the BGO journal and online in December 2009, we uh, published 15 uh, consecutive cases. Um, uh, where we achieved some success in keeping up the vision or improving the vision in a series, in this series of 15 cases. This four year old boy coming presenting with actually xanthocoria. This is a yellowish discoloration of the pupil, not actually a leukocoria. Why? Because of the deposition of the cholesterol and this grayish nodule on the macula, which turned out to be a choroidal and vascular membrane. And we can see at the periphery uh, of the same eye of the child, the, uh, um, the detachment, the exudative detachment in nature, and looking at the fluorescein geography, we can see the capillary non perfusion along with telangiectasia. Again, telangiectasia is the dilatation and then uh, um, uh, recession and then the constriction and then the dilatation of the vessels, as you can see uh, uh, on different grades of uh, uh, fluorescein geography flow. Because of the high presence of the high retina in the retinal detachment and the excess fluid, we, uh, we kind of thought about the telangiectasia. And back at the time, 2006, 2008, in, in macular telangiectasia, uh, uh, the, the use of triamcinolone was really introduced in the other form of the telangiectasia. And it proved to be effective. So thinking the same concept of thinking, we thought that if we inject Tramcinerone in a dose of four milligram at the time, it will kind of release the subretinal fluid exudation to be amenable for laser on a second session after resorption of the subretinal fluid. And this is what we did in the whole series, actually, and it proved to be effective. 
what about stage five ad, or advanced coast disease where the uh, uh, retina is totally detached and it exists and persists behind the lens? So what we did at the time, thinking of the exclusive process and nature of the uh, disease, <clears throat> we took the child to surgery, even before surgery, we go back and spend time in making sure our diagnosis is correct. We are 99% sure we cannot be mistaken. We have to be 100% sure by looking at the peripheral telangiectasia under anesthesia, where we really indent and magnify and, and really look back again and again onto the uh, telangiectatic vessels at the periphery where they dilate, constrict, and then dilate again. Once we are sure, we can uh, at ease uh, go back and do whatever we do in these cases. We cannot be mistaken with retroblastoma. You know, I will never forgive myself if I open an eye, hardening the tumor without, you know, uh, with, a, with a clumsy or an inaccurate mistake. So what we do is we go infrotemporal. We uh, slice a 90% thickness flap of the sclera. <clears throat> Then uh, in here, it's really important to put a, a, an anterior chamber infusion. We go back and open up the deep, uh, deep sclerotomy here, the deep part of the sclera, and we use a 28 gauge cannula to go into the subretinal space and uh, absorb the subretinal fluid in a very controlled way. We open up whenever the eye gets, gets a bit on the softer side, we open up the uh, anterior chamber infusion to maintain pressure within the vitreous cavity. And you can see this is a huge amount, like three cc, cubic cc of turb, murky, full of cholesterol and, yeah, no, and uh, very shreddy tissue subretinal fluid. And this is the end of surgery where the retina is absolutely flat in here. Not absolutely, it's like 95% flat with some residual subretinal fluid. We do inject uh, 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 kinacort, we decrease the dose and then this is how the eye looks out uh, at the intra end of surgery. I took the camera and I photographed. This is how it looked, it looked after the being totally uh, 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 in stage five uh, Coats disease. So the conclusion was any intervention in Coats should save the eye and vision. Triamcin alone, four milligram in help in rapid re resolution of the telangiectasia. Uh, however, we had an incidence of cataract that developed a year later, so we decreased the dose of the two milligram, and we knew that Coats disease can be associated with toroidal neovascular membrane. Another differential is the persistent fetal vasculature that can have a wide range of presentation, and uh, actually, <clears throat> it has an anterior component, and of more interest for us is the posterior component of persist persistent fetal, fetal vasculature. This is a child where we accidentally, while photographing the fundus, we could see the persistent hyaloid artery uh, going into uh, the vitreous. It has a huge myriad of association, and bilateral form is rare. Whenever you see it, we have to, to think about systemic syndromes like Pateau or Nori uh, disease. The persistent uh, uh, vascular loop, the posterior vascular loop, the Bergmeister papilla, and the congenital cyst in the vitreous are a, a, a signs of a posterior form of PHPV. The unilateral uh, uh, epiretinal membrane and the macular ectopia, as you could see here, is another sign of persistent uh, posterior PHPV, uh, um, especially uh, if not associated with the microphthalmic eye. Those eyes are usually not the anterior form associated with the microphthalmic eye. Um, the severe forms, of course, have uh, anomalous retina, and it's really useless to go and propose surgery for such diseases. Here is the spectrum, a whole spectrum of a persistent form of uh, PHPV, where you can sometimes see the retina posteriorly detached. You can see a stalk in the tertiary vitreous formed, and this is the primary vitreous around the retinal fold, or an opaque posterior hyaloid or posterior vitreous coming as a fold by itself, pulling on the back of the retina. Um, so the, uh, in the posterior part, actually we can help uh, if we decide to interfere with surgery. Um, uh, and the, uh, you know, the, the, we can remove or not remove the uh, uh, lens depending on how uh, the uh, surgery goes. Usually there is a stalk and we can preserve the lens. Whenever we can preserve the lens in posterior segment surgery, we do everything we can, even if it's mildly cataractus, to preserve the lens. 
In here, we can see a posterior form of PHPV, and we can see the stoop, and we can see the uh, uh, retinal, the macular ectopia. Uh, we use bimanual surgery in these instances, uh, use a, a 3cc a syringe to go bimanually and unfold the retina by meticulously and carefully dissecting the uh, retinal membrane that is inducing this kind of a macular uh, ectopia. We go very slowly. We're really not in, interested in inducing any holes or any retinal thinning at the time. So with the proper uh, chandelier light direction, with proper bimanual technique, we can actually remove the, uh, uh, the, the, the fold, the upper retinal membrane, the posterior uh, fetal vasculature that induced retinal detachment. We leave the retina to unfold eventually. Uh, uh, and, you know, the patient can regain fixation uh, if we do proper, um, uh, you know, amblyopia therapy uh, at the time. The ocular toxocara is another uh, <laughs> big on the differential of uh, um, the uh, uh, leukoporia, and it has really different presentations. It's not the usual retinal fold presentation, but I'm presenting this 13 year, years old female coming with six months history of blurred visual acuity, had recent mycoplasma pneumonia, and this is where we found this picture coming with this mass that has an umbilication and kind of a feeding arteriole and the draining uh, venule. Um, <clears throat> the mass is surrounded by subretinal fluid, having an associated detachment with one plus vitreous cells. And this is where fluorescent geography, hypofluorescence, and can acquire pooling of the dye, eventually staining and pooling of the dye with the subretinal fluid around the mass touching up on the fovea. Um, she had this pulmonary infiltrate. This was out of the COVID area. So this wasn't the COVID-19 case. This was back years back. Isinophilia, the ELISA and, and aquasumer sample showed toxocara antibodies related to puppies at home coming with a typical presentation and having a myriad of presentations. So we have to keep this in mind that a, a retinal granuloma can be a, a presentation of toxocara. Retinal fold is another presentation. presentation. Nematode in endophthalmitis with severe uh, gliosis, uh, severe vitritis, falciform ligament and tractional detachment, along with the granuloma. Isolated granuloma comes as localized mass with discrete margin, umbilication, serous retinal fluid. Um, and, you know, the ELISA may need, uh, a, or we can need a, a PCR to confirm the diagnosis from the aqueous humor sample. If we see a similar lesion and we are in doubt, just wait for a couple of weeks. If you don't see vitritis, wait for a couple of weeks where the tumor will grow. And this is a huge differentiating point between small granuloma and the growing malignant tumor like retroblastoma. So just, you know, if you're not sure, do not go and, you know, decide anything for the patient, just wait a bit. And this is a little, this little bit will make you confirm the diagnosis. Sometimes we meet, you know, dilemmas. You know, this four month old boy, <clears throat> coming with vitreous hemorrhage, obscuring the macula in one eye. And the other eye has a total exerted detachment with a very thin retina with these white spots on the retina. And what I thought was perivascular sheathing with an extremely thin uh, retina. Everything was normal. You know, the bleeding profile was normal. The CBC, the ESR, the C-reactive protein was normal. And the child was starting to get fixation uh, uh, nystagmus, you know, sensory nystagmus. So this was, for me, the decision for surgery. Of course, the eye with vitreous hemorrhage was the easier eye, you know, thinking all the time what to do with the other eye where I cannot see a break and there is these, these spots. So the vitrectomy went fine. And in two to three weeks time, comes the left eye, and this was the surprise. We always examine the kids uh, in the OR, and this was the real surprise. You know, taking the picture with the red cam, you know, was I mistaking for the eye? Was, was, the, was this, this a wrong child um, taking the photography off? So the, the, what I did while performing the vitrectomy for the first eye, I get periocular two milligram of triamcinolone, knowing that this is not an infectious process, this is what I did, and this is how the child came on a month later with a totally flat uh, posterior segment. Um, you know, I was sure that if I went with doing vitrectomy in such an eye, I would have lost the eye easily because of the, uh, you know, the need to flatten it out and the need to do uh, peripheral uh, um, retinotomy and the 
subsequently, the se severe subsequently of such a procedure in an eye with a very firmly attached posterior hyaloid. So yeah, and for the luck, for the good uh, uh, intuition, the two milligram periocular uh, triamcinolone did the job uh, 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 and they did really well, or maybe this was the uh, uh, act of God, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> for those who don't have stereopsis, uh, sometimes the coloboma can be seen as a mass into the posterior segment. And this is a real good test of stereopsis, you know, and I met, you know, people who would send this patient for having a mass without even having a mass. So the, the midfacial anomalies are associated with colobomas. Um, it can be just to remind you that neurofibromatosis type 2, frontonasal dysplasia, the charge syndrome where the eye is colobomatous, microphthalmics having heart defects, coenal atresia, retard growth and genital anomalies uh, describe the charge syndrome. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, it is of concern, of course, to have the thinking of the association. Because we are in, in a world of epidemics, uh, Zika virus came to Africa four years back. This wasn't really a way. And it is related to uh, the Aedes aegypti uh, mosquito that is transmitted uh, by, uh, uh, by uh, the mosquitoes. It went to Brazil in 2015 and came to uh, uh, um, you know, Africa in 2016. Um, and the, there is a cross reactivity to dengue fever and other issues. <laughs> it is an RNA virus. It is one of the coronavirus. Um, um, the, uh, you know, the infection is usually mild or asymptomatic and uh, it can be uh, detected in brain tissue and CSF of the infant and amniotic uh, fluid and the fluid of the individuals, the other fluid of the individuals. Um, it is a neurotropic virus affecting progenitor cells of the fetus and it is really characterized by brain anomalies, intracranial calcification, uh, um, mig migrational disorders, CNS pathology, and it is diagnosed on a PCR level and an IgM or other uh, causes uh, of the uh, uh, brain anomalies. Um, studies have shown that uh, uh, pigment mottling, choreoretinal atrophy, optic disc anomalies, colobomatas are associated with uh, Zika virus. And actually, uh, the, uh, these are the picture of colobomas that can have a bit of a different um, uh, uh, pathology uh, than the regular normal looking fundus having a choreoretinal coloboma that can be an oblong uh, posterior pole and the characteristic uh, midbrain or brain anomalies with the microcephalic features of the Zika virus. Trabismus is an important uh, 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 findings in this with, uh, along with other uh, congenital anomalies. Um, it has been described uh, uh, by uh, the group of Meda et al. Uh, that uh, the, in 2016 that Africa had uh, an outbreak of, of uh, um, um, Zika virus and uh, it, it was heavily infected you know, like in countries like Algeria, Nigeria, South Africa, uh, Madagascar and others. Uh, and the, um, you know, two different strains had, had been recognized. And whenever you see, you see a microcephalic eye, a microcephalic, microcephalic head along with a coloboma, you should really raise the awareness of uh, uh, the uh, Zika virus and the teratogenicity induced by the Zika virus. Um, if we see a mass into the retina and the mass uh, uh, is kind of not seen by fluorescent geography, the mass is as it, as it doesn't really exist with fluorescent geography. The dye passes directly through the, the vessels, uh, like in this four year old uh, Syrian boy, where the left eye had this mass and the right eye has extensive retinal detachment showing no calcification. He presented also, also with multiple acnes. Think of astrocytic hamartomas of tuberous sclerosis. The mass does not have, it's a retinal mass, it does not have dilated vessels going into the mass and on Fluorescent geography, the mass as if it does not exist. So this is the, uh, the clues for diagnosis where the multiple acne is the tuberous as, uh, astrocytic hamartoma within the ventricles of the brain are uh, essence in the diagnosis in the advanced cases like the eyes with presenting with retinal detachment and a retinal mass that was proven to be an astrocytic hamartoma and not a, uh, a retinoblastoma. 
Um, the uh, congenital toxoplasma, and I'm sure you guys see a lot of those, where the uh, uh, infection is in utero, where the child comes with a coloretinal scar, whether in the macula or in the periphery, uh, can have a severe form of toxoplasmosis. Um, remember that there is intraclinical calcification, hydrocephalus, and it is an acquired infection or a congenital uh, infection. In this uh, uh, CT scan, you can see the, uh, uh, you know, the enlarged ventricles along with the calcification that are present in the, uh, in the brain in a congenital uh, toxoplasmosis syndrome uh, of a 10-month-old uh, child. So we met this uh, um, fractional detachment case. And at the time, we had no clue about it. We didn't know what exactly induced this fractional detachment. The child was not uh, uh, premature. She was healthy at the time. And she came with bilateral leukocoria with absolutely nothing to uh, see or to differentiate. So the decision was to, was to go for surgery. One eye was smaller than the other eye, so we decided to go to the with the a little bit larger eye. Sorry, the video stopped working. Okay, sorry about that. So what we do is you can see and try to isolate a plane where you uh, dif yeah, and differentiate the dense epiretinal membrane from the, uh, uh, sub from the retina. This is not as easy as it seems to be, but we have to be ready to do this uh, uh, for posterior and anterior segment pathology. We identified the regular trepan blue as a helper in uh, the uh, differenti differentiation of such uh, uh, pathology uh, and the ret normal retina, you can identify the disc here. And there was a chorioretinal uh, adhesion here. The vitreous was adherent to the retina. I was really trying hard to uh, isolate it, knowing what, what the heck was this? What am I dealing with? And then till we reached the point where we could uh, separate the this retinal fold from the overlying uh, uh, chorioretinal scar from vitreous scar. And by just doing a vitrectomy at this point, we could identify the membrane and isolate, isolate it from the retina. Very meticulously and very slowly, very slowly. And you had the idea that, yes, I find it. This is, toxo, uh, this is a toxoplasma scar. You know, that was really adherent uh, to the surrounding tissue. And we finished the dissection. We're extremely lucky to identify uh, the uh, membrane. This child from, was from Jordan. And this is how the eye looked like. This is where the chorioretinal scar was the, and the attachment of the uh, vitreous or the epiretinal membrane into, into it. Uh, and this is the other eye, like a week after surgery, the right eye. We could definitely go with certitude. The patient was put on an anti-toxoplasma uh, um, uh, course for a whole, uh, a whole uh, year. And actually she could see, you know, this was the amazing thing that we could help in, in really a uh, very impossible case. This video was sent um, uh, like a year later, well, a few months later by her mom from Jordan. And we're extremely happy to, uh, to be able to help. Um, you know, the metastatic endophthalmitis is important, you know, and it's, it's kind of important to know that maybe we can help. If we are not absolutely sure that this has no mass, you know, the, the difficulty was in the cyclotic membrane. The endophthalmitis ended up by inducing the cyclotic membrane. But I think by releasing the traction and the cyclotic membrane, we could do something in preserving the health of the eye. As you can see, it's really difficult to remove it. And the induced traction on the periphery has to be really released. Posterior segment is absolutely nice and we can really uh, uh, improve the uh, uh, outcome by performing a surgery. 
uh, uh, this child was near two years of age and we put an implant in uh, uh, such a child and we use silicon oil. Now we're using Tensirone uh, if you want to maintain the retinal stability depending on the situation and we remove the silicone shortly after. I'm finishing up with some golden rules that stood the rest of the test of time. So we have an unexplained retinal detachment in a child. Never presume that say, this it is traumatic. Many often times, mother would come and say, yeah, the child is out of uh, control and he always fights with his peers and maybe he's been hit. Remember that the trauma that would induce a retinal detachment would, would induce a, a, a lid echemosis, a conjunctival chemosis, a subconjunctival hemorrhage, and many other things. Retinoblastoma is, uh, is on the top of the differential. Do not miss a mass and examine the other eye. Sometimes we can find a small peripheral tumor that would help us in, in identifying retinoblastoma. Unexplained uveitis in pediatric age group, especially if associated with a malignant hypopian, are retinoblastoma until proven otherwise. The diffuse infiltrating pattern presents in a bit of an elderly child, 10, 11, 12 years. And this was the initial presentation that this child came about with and was diagnosed as retinal detachment. And he had multiple surgeries and the tumor went out of the eye and it was catastrophic. The end was catastrophic. Hypopian, malignant hypopian in a very quiet eye is a, 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 a big mistake because these tend to have a flat form of retinoplastoma and we should not be misled by the uh, diagnosis. Uh, if even the retina was flat, this is a malignant hypopian and really don't have much to do about it. Uh, the eye has to come out. This, these are examples, other examples of malignant hypopian. Uh, uh, <clears throat> of course, I'm sure you all do that. We examine the fundus uh, of any case of strabismus because of the macular residing tumor, where the uh, sensory esotropia here will, induce, will be induced by the absence of macular fixation, vitreous hemorrhage, spontaneous hyphema, never presumed traumatic, uh, unilateral bophthalmus. There is no such, uh, such a thing called unilateral bophthalmus. It will be unilateral secondary glaucoma in a child. Bophthalmus is a bilateral disease. But we have to be aware that retinoblastoma and medallocongenital medalloepithelioma can induce a large group in this pediatric age group. Do your best to identify the vitreous seeds. It's very important to know the staging of the retinoblastoma. And remember, in those advanced helpless cases, there is no point of fighting for the eye. You know, if this was the only eye, we'd do everything possible. But I mean, whenever we have a nearly advanced disease, we have to think about enucleation. Do not uh, do education on eye harboring retinoblastoma by the junior staff or the junior resident because the length of the optic nerve will affect mortality postoperative. If, it if it is less than one centimeter, this definitely affects the mortality of the child. So these are cases that has, was wrongly misdiagnosed and where the eye was open with a trabeculotomy here. And you can see a tumor, huge tumor that is almost the size of the eye. By the time people would, would refuse to do education, and we end up by catastrophe cycles. This is another case that was also diagnosed as retinal detachment, vitrectomy, massive tumor necrosis, orbital uh, uh, pseudo tumor presentation, and extraocular extension, as you can see. Uh, I hope I wasn't long, uh, Dr. Thank you very much for the kind of invitation that I'm hoping that this uh, little contribution uh, might just uh, raise some insight in uh, our daily practice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ihab, for such an informative, uh, elaborate presentation. And you left actually very little for discussion after explaining everything. I have just a couple of questions. So first, how reliable is the calcification to differentiate, be be differentiate between a retinoblastoma or diagnose with confidence retinoblastoma? OK, it's an extremely nice question, Dr. Dina Ayani, and I thank you much for raising the issue. The, you know, when we think retinoblastoma, there should be a mass and within calcification. So it's present only in 80% of cases. You have to be knowing that the uh, calcification is only present in 80% of cases. 5% are flat tumors, like the one I showed you, and these do not have any calcification. One might, might say that, you know, the cholesterol of quotes, of quotes has decalcification pattern. Yes, it can, but it is more like sitting on the choroid. 
the cholesterolosis of coats. Once settling down, it settles on the choroid as if delineating the posterior uh, aspect of the eye or the posterior wall of the eye. So this is a huge difference in the pattern of calcification, of course, in the absence of a mass. So whenever you see a mass without calcification, without the acne on the face, without the astrocytic hamartomas in the brain, think about retinoblastoma as a first and maybe the only di the diagnostic challenge at the time. Okay. Dr. Ahmed Awadin, you have a question for Dr. Ihab? Yes, please. I have a question regarding the long time course of coast disease because many cases we see patients who already have coast disease and have, they have a macro scar. And the dilemma is, are they still indicated for treatment? Should we go ahead and do laser or cryo? Or uh, it is now stationary and it would not progress later on? So the question they is, have, do they have an exudative detachment or not? No, just exudative and a macular exudative, but not an exudative RD. So is there yeah. any risk that they will progress later on and they will develop a retinal detachment? Or should right. we just <clears throat> leave them? Okay, I, I think about Coates disease with different stages of Coates in, in different ways. So there is the burnt out Coates. You know, you see the eye that is really burnt out as if irradiated, and this has been long been detached, and you know, there's nothing to be done. You know, the, art, the vessels are athletic, the telangiectasia is burnt out, the RPE is really yeah, any kind of uh, yeah, any effaced from the chronic subretinal fluid, and there is no use, you know, of doing anything. And I see the potentially active quotes where you can see a flat retina and a macular exudate, and maybe the grayish nodule that is proven to be choroid and vascular. I think. The group we described, we're group by, you know, our group who published the paper, we did a, a surgery in, in one of the elderly patients, and this grayish module that was referred to, to the, in the literature was a choroid and vascular membrane, and this is for me a sign of activity. I'm sure, Ahmed, if you do a fluorescein angiography, you will see the peripheral capillary non-perfusion. And for me, if you find a macular exudate with telangiectasia that are active to induce cholesterol deposition in the macula, with a capillary non-perfusion, this is an absolute indication for me to do laser. And this is an easy process, whether you do an indirect laser to the periphery or you do uh, uh, endogenic anesthesia, or you can have this child sitting and doing laser actually as of five, six years of age with the light argon laser photocoagulation. And I think it is important to remember that exudation, the membrane is a sign of activity in, uh, uh, in the uh, capillary uh, in the, due to the exudation from the uh, telangiectasia in the realm of, of the presence of capillary non-perfusion. The uh, stage four and five, where they have a total exudative detachment, I think this eye will be doomed to neovascular glaucoma or being burned out. So for me, this is another indication to preserve the anatomy. And I have to tell you the truth, you know, on a long-term follow-up using the technique I, I described with the group, uh, the eye was stable, and we have maybe like 5 to 7% recurrences over the years. So here we're maintaining anatomical stability and maybe a little bit of visual improvement, not a much of visual improvement with the potential of re-intervention if the exudation reappears again. Uh, Dr. Rahab Asim, you want to raise a question? Yes, first of all, thank you very, very Uh, 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 can you just raise up or be close to the, to the microphone, please? Uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, yes, a bit, a bit better. Uh. Okay. Uh, can retinoblastoma kill uh, the thymus if it's only a small tumor or does it have to be a huge one uh, to cause uh, the thymus? So the question was, can retinoblastoma uh, uh, Yani, can you can you manage to repeat it? Does, it? does it have to be very large to produce a secondary glaucoma or a bophthalmus, or it doesn't matter? It can be a small mass and still uh, presenting with bophthalmus. I think this, uh, this is the question, Dr. Rahab, right? Yeah, yeah okay. Time. Yani, so the, the causes of glaucoma in retinoblastoma, remember? big tumor with massive exudative retinal detachment on a long standing basis, long standing, yani, a couple of months due to neglection of treatment endovitreal tumor with vitreous seeding onto the trabecular meshwork and clogging the, uh, uh, the angle of the anterior chamber. This is the second cause 
of, of detachment. Neovascular glaucoma due to long-standing chronic detachment, also talking a couple of months waiting or few months from neglection. You know, we, 20 years back, when we talked about the, uh, with certitude about initiation, many of the, of the family say no, and we just take the patient home, you know, the child or the girl home without, you know, in doing an initiation. So these are the, for me, the main reasons why we do have a, a secondary glaucoma. And always remember, and there is no such a case that it is unilateral bufthalmus. I think you all agree whenever you see a secondary glaucoma. La, la, we don't agree. Uh, we don't agree. Uh, the, 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 with, with, the, with the mass. With the mass. There are cases of unilateral bufthalmus. But without a mass. Mishkeda? Definitely without a mass. Fine. Okay. Plus, if, uh, there is no unilateral bufthalmus with an exudative detachment and the presence of a mass. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we all agree. Alhamdulillah. Before it, have, it will show up itself easily. Well, can we uh, miss it? I mean, we have to do a, a very meticulous examination to, to detect the retinoblastoma in the thalamus, or it's just always very prominent and easy to, uh, to detect. Yeah, if we have if we have a clear vitreous and a clear fundus and a clear anterior, anterior chamber, I think you're you're very confident that it's not retinoblastoma. And on the contrary, the ciliocoroidal melanoma is another story in elderly. It's a totally different story. Like if you have a, a clear vitreous, a clear retina, retina in place, and you know by indentation there is no retinal detachment of exudative type, and the anterior segment is clear, you I think you you'd you'd be very confident. Yeah. If you see some seeds or um, yeah, and some seats on the uh, iris, on the anterior chamber, hyphema, any signs of uveitis or inflammation, you have to think two things, retinoblastoma and Langerhans cell histiocytosis, if it is in the anterior segment. The medallo epithelioma comes in a little bit elderly uh, uh, kids, eight, nine, 10 years, and you really have to look in, into the ciliary body by deep indentation or do a UVM at the time if you suspect that. It comes also with focal cataract, the medallo epithelioma. Thank you. Rehab, you mentioned the injection of triamcinolone in cases of advanced Coats disease with exudative detachment. Do you think it has a, a better effect than injecting an anti-VEGF or what's the role of anti-VEGF in these cases? Okay, well, I, we were first to describe triamcinolone and the logical thinking was this was a telangiectasia like the macular telangiectasia. The, the paper was published online in 2009 and it was like three, four years of work beforehand but we remember the whole anti vegf were launched in 2006. There was so, and the role wasn't that much of a clear uh, indication at the time. After we published the paper, a whole myriad of, of uh, papers came out and they always referred to our paper as the triamcinolone that they tried the Avastin, the Lucentis, the Ilea and everything else. And it seems to be working as well. A recent paper, 2020, described the incidence of cataract in advanced Coats disease, and it seems to be significantly high. So, you know, thinking back, was the four milligram inducing the cataract or was this the nature of the disease? You know, the two milligram uh, also it worked as well. Uh, we kind of reached a, a dose in pediatric age group in such a disease entity. So what we, this is what we could do with the, with the experience of Coats disease at the time. But this was the very initial use of trimacinolone in, in, in baby's eyes. But it should be also emphasized that these injections are just a temporary solution and a permanent solution is the laser or the cryotherapy on the telangiectatic peripheral vessels, correct? Not on the telangiectatic peripheral vessels, on the capillary non-perfused area that I'm thinking are the cause of the telangiectasia. Now, this is my reverse way of thinking. And you really should see the video and geography where you have the marsh of the RBCs and white blood cells. You can see them with your naked eye going extremely slowly in this area of capillary non-perfusion. So for my thinking, you know, after the, the treating dozens of cases that the, the first pathology is the capillary non-perfusion that should be treated with laser, that induced telangiectasia, that induced exudation. And really it is, it is huge. And I think it's totally underrated and under uh, uh, spoken about. Um, so go, going back to uh, 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 what you mentioned, the, uh, the injection helps to bring the retina back, to re release momentarily the exudation. And you know, we cannot do laser if the retina is beyond six millimeter from the uh, uh, choroid. 
because this will induce uh, atrophic holes. So the idea is to decrease whatever is secreted into the vitreous inducing secretory pseudo detachment to ring the retina back in position. Once the retina is back, it's very amenable to laser and laser is the solution, not vitrectomy. You know, this vitrectomy, we lose eyes. We simply lose eyes, you know, because we will never be able to trans vitrally drain the fluid, you know, and if you do this, the eye is totally lost, no matter what you do about that as well. Correct. Uh, Dr. Magda, I can see you want to ask a question. أنا طبعا يعني عايزة أشكر طبعا إيهاب لأن أنا بكون سعيدة جدا بأي حاجة باثولوجي أكيد يعني بجد شكرا ليك يا إيهاب بس أنا ليا سؤال آه الحالات اللي إحنا باثولوجيكالي بندرسها لأنها حاجة اسمها ريتينوسايتوما أو بيناين فورم أوف ريتينوبلاستوما هل دي كلينيكالي يعني موجودة فعلا أو هي ممكن تبقى سسبكتد إزاي يعني؟ يس يعني أنا يعني يعني after seeing hundreds of cases of retinoblastoma and managing them I would say anything between two to three percent, Dr. Magda. And I, and I can tell you that I've seen the whole spectrum. Patient coming with bilateral atrophy. This is an extreme spectrum. A patient coming with unilateral retinocytoma with active contralateral, يعني a spontaneous arrest hassle fain. We can see the, the stages of, of uh, um, regression. Where Antony has an active big tumor filling the eye. Uh, and I've seen unilateral regressed retinoblastoma that really looked as if treated. And, يعني, we, and you can mm -hmm. see a scar, حواليها, مفيش, there is no much of an exudation. The eye is, يعني, you can see all, almost always a type three regression uh, with, with the form of uh, uh, non-active uh, vessels going into the tumor, very flat vessels going onto the tumor. Always give the chance for follow-up. And clue here, the, the catch here, is that those kids have the uh, hereditary form of retinoblastoma, hatta if they are presenting unilateral. Yani those kids have the uh, RB gene, the hereditary form, with all the implication on their offspring as well. But they have to be followed. The second catch, and this tumor can be active in any stage in their life. But they have to be followed up as well. Later on, active in a fraction of those up patients, for, yeah, for, for, yes, for a yes. long time. Yeah. أنا بقول لحضرتك كان في عيانة ثمان سنين ما نساهاش أبدا unilateral spontaneously arrested with all types of regression and the contralateral eye has a big tumor that was active. The mm -hmm. eye was initiated and this eye was followed for years and was stable. Mm -hmm. شكرا يا Thank you, Dr. Magda. My last question, Dr. Ihab. So when we have the clinical suspicion of retinoblastoma beside the ultrasound, which imaging modality do you prefer, especially if you're suspecting a germline mutation in the child, an MRI or a CT scan? So thank you for the question, Dr. Adina. You always have uh, yeah, back tricks that are very informative as well. So, so the hereditary form of retinoblastoma have the mutation in one gene in the whole body. The 13Q deletion is one hit in all the body and two hits in the retinal cells in both eyes. If we expose the child to a minimal dose of CT radiation, we are exposing to hazardous radiation that can have an effect on any site in the body, especially in the area of head and neck. So this is not one thing that is really preferred, even if we give a, a micro sievert doses to, the, uh, to those kids. So the advice is, this is one. This is one reason I never order a CT, even to look for a pineuroblastoma. So this is one. CT is sensitive for calcification. But as I mentioned, 80% have calcification, 20% do not have. So I'm looking here for a tissue-specific imaging or scanning module, which will be into the MRI. The MRI would be the best imaging technology or modality to look at the pineal gland, to, to look specifically at the retinal mass and the exudative detachment associated with it. And if we really look hard into the retinal mass, calcification depend will be either black spots on T1 or uh, um, on T2, uh, on, would be like hyper intense on T1 and hypo intense on T2. So we can see calcification also on, on MRI. Thank you so much, Dr. Ihab. So I want to ask if any of the panelists have any further questions. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, Dina. Uh, 
thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rehab, Dr. Ahela, and Dr. Ehab for the informative presentations and the informative thoughts. Thank you, Dina, for the nice moderation. Uh, thank you for attendees and um, uh, congratulations for the national team of Egypt. We are in the quarterfinal. Uh, hey. Uh, for the handball. <laughs> Congratulations and um, stay safe and good night. Thank you all and uh, meet you uh, inshallah ala khair next episode inshallah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank, you. Thank 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 you. Th